Greeting, Dark Greetings. Horses. Welcome back. We've got another podcast. We've got a, a new guest, Professor Blake. Hey. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Thanks, y'all. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you moved to Colorado not too long ago. About a year ago. A little over a year now. And I've seen you around the academy, but I have not got to spend much time with you. So this yeah. is a... I'm only there like once or twice a week right <laughs> now. I've been off the mat a little bit because I got this eye surgery, but I should be getting back to training next week, too. Yeah. Okay. So now I've I've actually not met you before today. Yeah. Um so uh, could you could you fill me in a little bit? Uh yeah, how what's your what's your jujitsu story? What's uh, uh so where did you start? My jujitsu story starts in two thousand seven. My uh dad had a coworker who was talking about it. We'd always been fans of like the UFC and tried to watch all of them if we could. But uh, we never, I mean, we didn't really have anything in common either. Like, he was really into cars and, like, cool stuff. And I like card magic and, you know, <laughs> dorky stuff. So we never really had anything in common except for the UFC. And when he finally found an academy for us to go train at, we um, we started out, took our first class, and I was hooked instantly. And then uh, a couple years go by, I start... Um, teaching the kids program at my first academy in North Texas Mixed Martial Arts. It was an MMA academy, not really a jiu-jitsu focused school. They did a, like all kinds of different classes and things, but uh, I got the opportunity to start helping out with the kids classes. And then from there, I became the head kids instructor and I was in, responsible for the curriculum and like ordering belts and, you know, just kind of keeping the kids in line and making sure everything was moving forward. And then around, it was 20... 2014, 2015, we decided that we were going to open up our own academy, and uh, we did that in Corinth, Texas. We called it Top Game Jiu-Jitsu Studio. Uh, we did that for about five years. Had a couple of Pan Am World, Masters Worlds medalists, and it was a good time. And then we decided that uh, we wanted to kind of see what else was out there, so we sold the academy in December of 2018, I think. Yeah, so we sold it in December of 2018. And then about a year later, I saved up some money and I moved out here. And then I've been out here ever since. Been about two years, almost just over a year, closer to two years, but just over a year now. Boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, kind of the abridged version. I was a pretty heavy competitor back in Texas. Uh, not much of a gold medalist. I always joked I lived on second place, like that was my spot. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I've got so many silver and bronze medals, it's crazy. Um, I think my favorite one was we had the ADCC trials come through, and when I was a blue belt, I think I was like 17, I got silver at the trials there, so that was pretty sweet. That was my probably my, my favorite accomplishment that I had, because I was more of a no-gi guy in the early belts, and then once I hit purple, I really started to adopt the gi, because uh, in 2007? No, no, that's way too early. Maybe about 2010, I think it was, we went to Worlds. And there was a dude in my two dudes in my division named Joao and Paulo Miao, and I saw them tearing people up with this weird daily heave guard thing. And then uh, as soon as I saw that, I dove headfirst into that, and it's been pretty much just gi ever since. Yeah, I had a student that was obsessed with them when they were purple belts. That's yeah, that was my division purple belt. I yeah. got I lost my first match <clears throat> five to eight, and then the guy who beat me fought Paulo, and he got armbarred in like nine seconds. It was just over and done i mean those dudes terrorized that division that day yeah. so and then yeah ever since then it's been mostly gi i like no gi a little bit uh the leg lock game kind of started to get a little boring because that was just all people were doing and i kind of fell away from that um but yeah it's been mainly gi since then boom yeah mm -hmm. love it so I had a similar experience with the the no gi thing i wrestled in high school so i felt way more comfortable in no gi so I preferred that, even though there wasn't a lot of it offered. Uh, I can't remember how it was broken down at Easton. But then when I went to Brazil, like all I did was the gi. And so when I came back, I took the gi off. I was like, Whoa, Yeah, it feels weird, doesn't what it? What do you I don't do? Have the handles. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, did a lot of that. Uh, running the academy was a lot of fun. It was kind of kind of hard being like the guy. That was what I struggled with the most because you know I was. 24 you know i didn't i had people who were way older than me training under me and like yeah. you know i mean it's just i i, I kind of equate it to imposter syndrome yeah. you know where it's like am i really you know the guy who's supposed to be here doing this this guy's a freaking doctor you're like, yeah you're it telling was them what to do exactly and yeah. it really kind of 
ate away at me and I think that was a big part of our decision to kind of let the academy go too besides like finding other things because I mean jujitsu had been my job since I was like 15 you know 15 16 so what are you doing now uh I work in uh the cannabis industry I work at a a uh, place called Green Dot Labs. We yep. make different hash and things like that. I actually interviewed to work in the grow to actually uh, work with the plants on Friday. So I'm really hoping that comes through. Boom. But yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Nice. That's what I wanted to do once I moved out here. So I'm glad I kind of got in the industry pretty quick. I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh. Growth industry? Yeah, it's definitely growing, especially with the pandemic. It's just skyrocketed. Yeah. You know, people are buying more because you're staying home yeah. what the hell else are you gonna do when you're staying home yeah so. you gotta you gotta figure yeah it's been it's been a good time i've been en- i've been enjoying my stay out here i'm ready for i'm ready for some more warmer weather but yeah it's been the tide time. may roll back at some point but it's like more states are getting med- med- medical more states are getting legal uh it's just continuing to move on and grow and like those you know some companies are like trying to go real big with it which yeah, whatever it's going to happen. Yeah, uh, I think, but. yeah, there, I mean, a million dollars a month isn't crazy for places like this, you know? The first place I worked at was a dispensary, and they were saying they make $24, $28 million a year, just, whoa, just for a plant. Yeah. <laughs> it's growing a plant, you know? Yeah. Wow. It's pretty. It makes you think if it was hadn't been illegal this whole time, would it even be that, you know? Like, is it only like this because it was illegal for so long that people are really trying to get in on it, or would it nah. be like this the whole time, you think? I mean, it would have been like... It would have been like alcohol. You think? I mean, alcohol is still a, what, trillion dollar, quadrillion dollar business worldwide. It's yeah. still, you know, it's like the thing everywhere. Uh, and again, point. you know, it's the same kind of thing. The, the concept is a fungus that just does its natural process. And all of a sudden you've got a mood altering substance. There you go. There's, makes you think, like, there's is it all the, the fortune in the world. Is it like the plant's defense mechanism to make people to like ward off predators, but then we find it, we're like, oh, sweet. <laughs> oh, <this is laughs> no, yeah, I think yeah, it's the man. other way around, man. It's like the sugar content in apples, right? The apples kind of notice that like, hey, we're surviving. We're doing good when we make really sweet fruit that the bears and the people want to eat and then spread around. And so oh, like, yeah, I never thought so apples like got sweeter, so that they got spread further. Right, the apples made a thing that their predators wanted, so that they go, so that they propagate. And I think cannabis at this point is, for one thing, so uh, artificially uh, grown. Right, like wild cannabis is almost not a thing yeah. anymore, and so it's it's engineered. Right, so like um, don't see a lot of wild cows out there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So it's like it's all meant for that that profit, that specific thing. And so That's an interesting take. I never yeah. thought of it like that. That's makes a lot of sense too. That's really yeah. cool. It's like it, it engineered itself and manipulated us so that it could survive. Yeah, because it's doing a good job. Engineered is a good word for it, because these plants are as tall as I am after like eight weeks. They're huge. They're good. huge. Like Wow, you know, yeah. definitely wouldn't get that way in nature. Definitely not. And they're just, you know, you'll find the things that you like in that plant. You'll breed with another plant and you'll find more things that you like and you just break it down until you get the one that you've been looking for with all those different characteristics too. I wonder if it would have went like that in the wild. I don't think it at such an accelerated rate, but right. it's fun to postulate on. Yeah, well, there's no way to tell now, but we can think about it like like dogs. Right? That's, yeah, that's a good way we to think about it. We took dogs out of the wild and we just thought, oh, look at that. That specific characteristic, I want way more of that. Mm-hmm. I you want longer can't release legs. a pug into the wild. It's no. not right. Good. You can't. They, they can't even swim. And they're still like <laughs> making new dog breeds, too. Yeah. Like over the last couple of years, there was this new breed that was just made out of Russia. You know, a whole new type of dog. It's wait, wait, wait. There's a breed made out of Russia? Well, made in Russia. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, that's a unique breed right there. <laughs> Really cold in the winter. Also, yeah, they're big, thick. That's a nerd dogs. joke, folks. Yeah. You want to move on now? Thank you, Jamie. You're gonna speak. Speak into the mic. Speak. Speak into in the, mic. the mic. There you go. You just adjust it. There you go. You got it. Where were we? Breeding dogs, weed. 
you know, fun stuff. Breeding dogs, yeah. You guys have dogs? Uh-huh. What kind of dog you have? Uh, he's a Rottweiler mix. He's He's got the Rottweiler coloration, but he didn't have, like, the box head, and he's, like, half the size of an adult male. I like Rottweilers. Rottweiler. They look like angry labs. <laughs> they look like mean versions of And he's, lab. like, the least angry dog. Yeah. That's, that's just misconceptions. Like, my dad has yeah. a pit bull. It's the nicest dog you'll ever meet. Oh, yeah. yeah but yeah. she's, you know, she's And they're legal, in, they're legal in Denver as of the last, one of the last... Uh, were they not before? They were not. They really? were illegal in the city of Denver from some stupid ordinance. Wow. They're legal again, but you have to have them essentially license plated. Yeah, I've never met a, a pit bull I didn't like. It's, you it's, put it on their butt? It has to be on their collar, and then you have to like register them with the city, what kind of dog it is. That you have all their stuff put together like you, you can't have any bump stocks on the pit bull <laughs> right you can't, <laughs> you can 3D print it, so who cares? <laughs> can't have 30 round clips on the, on the on the pit bull right yeah right no modified exhaust can't hide it in your pocket nope huh. all right open walkies <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well at least they're legal again yeah i couldn't imagine i couldn't imagine. i have a chocolate lab and it's like my favorite thing in the world. I can imagine somebody's like, you couldn't have that here. Like, nah, I'm bringing my dog. Like, yeah. yeah. People had pit bulls. Like, you'd see them. Yeah. I don't know. Did you get a ticket? They, giving out tickets? Yeah, I don't know how that played out. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. The police just look the other way. You arrest your dog. <laughs> it's like leaned up against the car with <laughs> the paws behind arrest. his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know how that worked. I didn't hear much about it, so I don't. I don't. I don't think they were real strict about enforcing it. But yeah, I, I don't know. Probably yeah. more important things to look after, you know, you especially in a city like Denver. Over a million people, real freaking crime and stuff. You know, there's stuff to look after. Who do we stop? The robber or the dog? Oof. <laughs> the dog is so pretty. <laughs> so, you've had kind of like a an interesting trajectory, right? And, and a fairly interesting experience from my thought in that, like, kind of reached one of the pinnacles of, of the jujitsu lifestyle, mm. right? Like, you had your own academy, had your own students, you were like, you, were, you had the dream, yeah, right? In, in a lot of people's estimation, right? You had the thing. Um, and then that, wasn't working for you or whatever. Um, and so you, you walked away. Mm -hmm. It seems to me very rare that black belts walk away from the game. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what was that? I mean, what was that experience like kind of getting to the top of the top of the heap, the top of the mountain, and then, stepping off of that uh it was disheartening for sure it was um because like i said i'd been doing this and only this since i was a teenager you know i didn't i didn't know any other kind of jobs like i worked like at a chili's i worked at like a dog kennel like really simple jobs that you know you do when you're young and then I was thrust into this leadership role that kind of fit you know i was i was making a decent paycheck it wasn't all my responsibility, you know. I was I wasn't the guy. I think it was a lot of um, it was a lot of pressure on me. I didn't I didn't enjoy it as much anymore. You know, it kind of took the love of the game away from me because it was literally just me and my dad. We didn't have anybody working the front desk. We didn't have anybody working the phones. I mean, if there was an issue with collecting payments or anything like that, it all fell on me, and that started to like blur the lines between being the instructor and being the owner, which I think is possible to do both, but you need things to buffer between you and the students when it's not about teaching, and we didn't have that. So people had the relationship with me as an instructor and a friend, and if you know you could pay that month or there was you know this or that or whatever it came down to, it was really hard to separate the money from the students 
and that I think was the biggest thing because my dad worked a full-time job as well as coming in and the gym was just all consuming of me you know I, I very rarely could take a sick day I mean I had to I had to be there all the time and it really took the jujitsu away from it and it made it more about running a small business that relied on people to be dedicated to something that was incredibly difficult in an area that wasn't necessarily affluent. You know, it was if you're gonna spend your spare money on doing something, are you gonna spend something money on something that's difficult and you go home sometimes thinking what the hell am I doing versus going out to the bar because I grew up in a college town you know that was kind of the culture there was you go to the bar and it was cheap it was easy you felt better and then you went home and that was kind of your therapy like that so it put a lot of strain on me and my wife at the time you know because she was the person who was really the breadwinner and that caused a lot of issues with us and then uh, I think selling the academy was my attempt at kind of bridging that gap and taking that pressure off of her but I think it was already too late so it was a lot of personal and uh, like family things because I don't know if you guys have ever been in a family business especially with somebody like your father who you know had been there since you were born like I like I was how I kind of imagined it in my head is like this guy is the dude who used to wipe my ass like right. why is he going to take anything that I say as like into hard consideration. I think yeah. that was difficult for him and I think it was difficult for me to understand that because you know I had been teaching, training and working in martial arts academies my whole life so when I thought I had a good idea I thought it was the right move. We would butt heads and since he was the guy who kind of put all the money up he ended up having the final say and that really did not work out well for our relationship so it was really yeah. a you know we got to either figure out how this is going to be profitable or we need to get rid of it and we just could not come to terms on how that was going to work so that was that was another big thing that kind of went into it so yeah it was good to be at the top of the mountain and to like have i guess the dream but it really wasn't the dream it really i guess it wasn't really what i wanted i wanted to help people in jiu-jitsu like it helped me and i like to teach like i really like to just sit and talk about jiu-jitsu with people and kind of you know if somebody has an issue like i can't pass the guard why not Breaking that down, you know, maybe your posture's bad. Maybe you just don't have the right grips. Maybe you're not moving fast enough. Maybe your hips are in the wrong position. That's the thing that I like. But once it started to be, that was how I survived. And if something went wrong, it was just, you know, I didn't eat that month. That was when it got difficult. So, because I, I didn't have the ability to have, you know, a full-time job and do that the way that my dad did because, you know, he was the one who was help funneling cash in there at the end of the month if we didn't make it for some reason. So, that was already stressful enough on him. So, it was just, it was a whole lot of things that we didn't take into account when we first opened. You know, when we first opened, we opened a whole building. We bought nice mats. You know, we sunk a bunch of money into it. It's, you know, with that old adage, if you build it, they will come. Uh -huh. That was kind of our thought process. Uh -huh. That was not the case. It did not work out like that. So that was already us playing catch you know, up. Chasing our, the dragon. Yeah. I mean, our first couple of, our first year, maybe year and a half, fairly profitable. Like we thought that it was going to take off. Um, we had a little bit, I, I guess the word I'm thinking of is descent in our academy. Some of my students got a little, uh, too big for their britches, I guess, is a good uh -huh. way to put it. And um, sewed a lot of like, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, follow this. This is better. You yeah. know, um, that kind of mentality and culture a, started to had build. Had a cult in your culture. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. And, um, mm. you know, one of the guys, uh, the guy who kind of started it, ended up moving to a different academy up in um, training out of an old, uh, I guess it was a laundromat, that what it was first. And now they're one of the biggest academies in the world so I'm glad he kind of found what he was looking for but before he left he really started this culture of you know Blake doesn't know what he's talking about and that really was kind of the decline because I was I, I wanted to have a competitive academy I wanted to go to tournaments I wanted people to know who we were and I wanted to be formidable yeah once I lost that it became more of a social club and I couldn't handle that that was not my that was not my goal I did not want to have an academy where we taught you know, foo foo technique. People came in, they chatted, and then we went to go to the Mexican restaurant and hang out. It's not bad, but that's not what my goal was. Yeah. I wanted to have a, an academy. You know, yeah. I wanted to have good students. I wanted to compete, and I wanted to be just about the training. And you know, I'm sure you know you've probably had shit like that happen in Dark Horse too. But yeah. it uh, it was just something that we weren't able to overcome, unfortunately. So.
it uh it was nice once I sold the place and I could kind of focus on my own jujitsu again for a little bit. But you know, I miss having you know some time to sit and talk about it with people because that's what I'm doing all day. I'm just sitting at work thinking about as I'm filling up boxes of hash. I'm just thinking like, why did I get my guard pass last time? What was my foot in the wrong spot? Or I'll go on lunch break and I'll just watch videos of like old competitive matches that I love. Like I watched uh, Hoffa Mendez versus Ryan Hall the other day from. Uh, when they met in the worlds a couple of years ago and I saw some of those techniques that they were doing and I went instantly taught that in class because one, I could kind of share that and two, it could kind of work through it in my own head. You know, uh, why did that work? What about it could I apply to myself? You know, that's what I wanted and it was just not what I got. So, I, I, that's the best way I could explain it. Yeah, there's always, with, in large groups of people, there's always going to be different points of view and there's always going to be some sort of conflict. I feel like in general, I've been super lucky <clears throat> as far as like the, the, all the drama I've seen at other academies or I hear about. I feel like Dark Horse in general stays pretty drama free for the most part. Yeah. And like when it does come up, you know, like whatever, I deal with the best I can. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the culture maybe is pretty go along to get along, pretty respectful maybe is better. I've enjoyed my out. time there. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, the students when I teach are always really receptive. Um, there's a lot of higher belts who come to the beginners classes to help out, which I think is a sign of a healthy academy. You know, when, when the upper belts aren't too full of themselves to say, I don't need the beginners class anymore. And their goal is to go in and help the other students. I know Popeye and James and Brittany are really, really big about that. And that's, yeah. that's, that I think is a sign of a healthy academy. Yeah. But it's inevitable. Yeah. Things will happen. You know, people yeah. have egos. I mean, yeah. It happens. Yeah. But yeah, it was a. We, we wanted something, we didn't get what we wanted out of it, so we found somebody who thought that they could do it, and they've been doing great. Like, the Academy's still open. Like, it's still operating today, and they still have, like, I think uh, one of my old buddies, Jason, just got promoted to black belt. He just won uh, pans at Brown in the Gi, which was, I know that was our goal, yep. you know. Like, he, he came to me as a purple belt who really struggled and then just through a couple of years of really grinding it out you know started to medal at these big tournaments and eventually got his his gold at the pans which was phenomenal i wish i'd have been there it was uh it was really something to see so oh, that's awesome really cool really really cool but it's yeah. called top game top game top game jiu-jitsu studio it was kind of ironic because i'm a guard player and i thought guard mm. is always the top game in jiu-jitsu because it's i don't know it was it was it was a fun play on words and uh -huh. it was just when i thought when i thought of it it just stuck uh -huh. you know when you have the, the name of something you're like i have all these different ones but that's just the one that we kept coming back to huh. and uh yeah and we called it studio as like an art studio versus like uh an academy or something like that i don't huh. know it was just 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 I like words, so I was trying to find like the nice play on words that when people come over, they would see it and they're like, yeah, that looks right. And I felt like it looked right. Nice. It felt right. Yeah, picking out Dark Horse was like the hardest part of opening Dark Horse was settling on the name. Yeah, it's the name because that's like what you're going to be known as forever. You know? like a six-week process of going back and forth. Did you have any ideas. other like front runners that you thought of? Yeah, we're, we're, we talked about like Rogue or... There's a Rogue Academy in Texas, yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. there was another, something like that. There was actually a, a, a top game BJJ in like Maryland or something, and we copyrighted the name. And uh, they found us, and they messaged us on Facebook, and they're like, you guys need to change your name now. We've been running the Academy like this, and this is our name, and you guys need to stop. And we sent them the copyright notice that we uh, had on the name, and they uh, stopped. <laughs> they stopped messing with us pretty quick. And we're like, we'll let you live, just don't... What? Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> it um, is our name. Um, actually, yeah, for if real. If you want to push this, we will push back. Yeah, we'll take the name because so it's ours. So maybe drop it. Yeah. What do you think? And they did. It was a. It was. It was a quick little thing, but that just kind of reminded me. Yeah. Pretty funny. So, what would be the next mountain? What would be the next thing to look at? See, that's the thing. I don't know. You know, I'm almost thirty years old, and I gave up my first life's path that I've been on for 15 years. What is next? I have no idea. I found the first industry that I thought was cool. So I'm kind of coasting through that. And then, uh, I've been pretty lucky that you guys have been letting me, you know, come in and kind of give my perspective on jujitsu and give me the outlet that I've been looking for to kind of teach and, you know, just have my time to get this stuff that's on my brain constantly just out and kind of help people. So really I have no idea. 
I want to start competing again. I think I'm going to wait till I'm 30 so I can start going back in the master's division and give myself this year to kind of get back. I did a... Uh, the year you turned 30. What? You're, the year you turned 30, your master. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I went in for master's one. Um, I uh, did one of the fight to win pros while I was out here, but I was I had the flu and I was just horribly sick. And I lost a split decision, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> I lost a split decision. I was so sick. Oh, my God. I remember... Um, Who'd you fight? Oh, I don't remember his name. It was some Brazilian guy. I mean, his name, his name was so long that when Seth sent me the poster, I congratulated him from keeping all of it on, uh -huh. the, on the poster. Uh -huh. But um, I think I would have had that match had I not been so sick. But I remember uh, I was training at, um, oh, what's the name of the place? Uh, the Black Sea. Uh, what do they call it? I cannot think of the name of the academy. Brad runs it. It's out in Littleton. Mm-hmm. Uh, compound? Compound. Yeah, I was training out of the compound there, and, and uh, my buddy Dan was helping coach me, and he's just screaming at me, get up! And I'm like, dude, I can't. I can't move. I, this guy can't move. I was holding him in closed guard as long as I could. I think I had the only submission attempt of the whole match, which is why I got the split decision, but because I looked like such shit, they just could not give it to me, because they yeah. were like, people on people would riot. <laughs> they were like, yeah. you look like shit, so he won, but you had this best sub attempt, so they gave me the, the split on yeah. it. I'm 0-3 at fight to win. <laughs> first year, first time, got my ass beat. I <laughs> got beat bad. Uh, second time, uh, I had a dude in a triangle for like two minutes. He got out. Somehow he won. Don't know what was going on there. And then um, this last time, yeah, I lost a split. So two split decision losses and an ass beating as they've, far as that goes. They've changed the rules over the years with the, with the pro matches. It used to be like aggression or something mm -hmm. or submission attempts. Uh, I don't I'm know, not they, sure. They've, it's like, really hard. They've to, modified it. It's hard to judge something like that with no points. I think submission based would be a way to do it. Um, back in Texas, we had a no points, no time limit submission only tournament. Yeah. And most matches wouldn't go longer than ten minutes. You know, I yeah. think I had the longest match ever, which was over an hour, which I don't recommend. <laughs> Fucking sucked. I remember it was my ex-wife. It was her first time for her parents to come watch me compete. And they come walking up at the end of the match, and I'm going over to like say hi to them, and I instantly just throw up, <laughs> just like find this trash can and just puke right into it because I was so dead. An hour. An hour. Oof. It's on YouTube. It's like broken up into two or three videos. Oh, yeah. I have to look that up. Yeah, it's long. It's not great. <laughs> it's not my best showing. So it uh, it just it ends with me throwing on this just ugly triangle and just squeezing. I I was I told myself in my head, I'm like, this is my last shot. If he doesn't tap, I'm just gonna quit because he deserves it. <laughs> and I luckily he tapped. Luckily, he tapped. That sounds like a pretty epic battle to me, and a win. It was a uh, it was a lot of us trading bottom side side control. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a lot of us being like, "I'm on top now." Yeah, it was it was crazy. I can only imagine one the pro the pro matches the pro events are so long, anyways. One hour long match. Yeah. And then all of a sudden. I mean, nonstop. And I mean, you train for an hour sometimes. Like, you'll do an hour's worth of rolls or break it up into five minutes huh. and have those one minute breaks in between. But yeah, just going nonstop for an hour is ridiculous. Yeah. It was crazy. Like, both of us at the end of it were like, why? <laughs> why? Why are we doing this? But I think those tournaments are the ones I had the most success in. You know, I, I would usually win more of those versus like a timed point based match. So. Always what I preferred. Even if it's 20 minutes, people are like, okay, I just got to make it eight more minutes. Yeah. When you think eight minutes, you're like, that's not that long. But when somebody's trying to kill you at the same time, you're like, that's just a long time. For eight minutes, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah the, the more you gamify the, the thing, the more people are going to try to play that game. So It's like GSP in the UFC. <clears throat> yeah. It wasn't necessarily like the greatest fighter, but man, he could play that game. He knew how to take people down. He could throw combinations correctly and he would win. But... You know, it may yeah, not always be the most exciting. It's like a yeah. boxer. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's also like the champion's position, right? Where you're like, again, not that exciting, but you're not going to lose the game. Yeah. You don't necessarily, you don't even have to win anymore. You mm -hmm. just have to not, not lose. lose. Yeah. Floyd Mayweather isn't the greatest fighter of all time. Pretty solid technical boxer, though. Excellent boxer and yeah. excellent at playing the game, winning each round. Yeah. Knockouts? Yeah. No. Nah. Nah. No. Nah. Yeah, so I think there's something big to be said for like a no points, no time limit kind of format. Okay. There's one now, way to win. Right. A bunch good, of ways to lose. Good jujitsu. Do good jujitsu. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and honestly, like I said, the matches wouldn't really ever last that long. Like, that was just kind of a freak thing where neither of us wanted to quit. But like most matches would go five, ten minutes, just like a normal, just like a normal round. But because they took away all of those different avenues, it allowed matches to be won definitively. And I understand why Fight to Win can't do something like that. Like if you have no points, no time limit. If you have two guys like I don't know, just two heavyweight guys who aren't necessarily known for finishing. Like if you had Bruno Bastos versus Orlando Sanchez, you'll be yeah. there all fucking night. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Sanchez you, is you good, just but can't that, make that match. Yeah, you can't do it. I mean, look at look at his performance at the last ADCC. He won, but like not by anything spectacular. You know, a, p- a couple of good sprawls and just has he on done top. anything spectacular in shit too, ever? I don't know. He wins. <laughs> you know, he wins. ADCC so champ can't talk shit. You know what I'm saying? But like, nah, not so, exciting to watch. So annoying. Those matches, yeah. And the pro events already five hours long. Mm-hmm. Oh, and now man. even longer too, because he's starting throwing blue belts in there and shit uh, now too. Uh, kid, there's kids and blue belts, and I'm like, I love you, but no. Yeah. Don't. I don't want to go to those. I hate those events. Did you guys ever have Nagas out here? The Naga tournament? Long time ago. We uh, had, yeah, we had one some maybe of the worst. four or five years ago. Yeah. Are they, they were like super long? They were really big in Texas, but they were, just, I don't know if how it's gotten recently, but in the beginning they were so mismanaged. Like he would be there, you'd get there like 8, 7 a.m. and you wouldn't leave till like 9 p.m. Yeah. Just because there's empty mats. They don't know who's going where. It's just yeah. a, uh, it's just a clusterfuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, luckily, I feel like tournaments have gotten better over the years, but in the beginning, like, when I first started, at least where I was at, it was just mind-numbing, yeah. you know? I think Seth did it better because he's got those, he has that wrestling tournament background where he uses that uh, that specific program that kind of times out the matches and tells you exactly where you're supposed to be, and I think that's why those tournaments run a little bit more efficiently, but... Yeah, that's pretty recent. Yeah, you know, Naga was not like that. You go back 10 years ago, and, like, all the tournaments were pretty bad yeah, yeah if there were tournaments curve. you know pretty like bad. crazy that there were like uh, when i first started there was uh, carlos machado had winter wars once a year and that was it yeah. <laughs> that was it well, you traded your academy until then two good friends they were competing at pans at pans they went down to the bullpen to start warming up at noon 1 p.m and they both of them fought at like 6 p.m they were warming up for six hours. I bet they were fucking warm. Though. They were warm <laughs> they as were fuck. Hot. <laughs> warm as fuck. Yeah, uh, and that was pants. You know, like that was a major. Yeah. Yeah. The time I went to Worlds, it wasn't like that. They were pretty on point. So that must have been yeah, ten years ago. Sounds like a while. <coughs> well, it might have been more than that. I guess, yeah. yeah it's probably. It was probably. It's like two thousand one. It's probably fourteen. Yeah. It's probably. So I started training in Colorado in 2000. I graduated in 2005, so it was like 2003, 2004, probably wow. something like that. Yeah, that was still three years before I even started training. Masters Worlds, when we went, I was uh, I was on deck for like an hour and a half. That's so long. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. so long. You already got your nerves going, and you're, yeah. you're warm. You're like, I'm ready to go. And they're like, wait. Like, what the fuck do you mean, wait? Uh, well, and then you can't wait in the warm-up area. No, you can't. Mat, yeah. Right? You're waiting right behind the table. So I'm standing there. Masters is in Vegas, right? Masters yeah. Worlds, yeah. That's where yeah. we went. I don't know if it had always been there, but that was always my favorite tournament of the year. Masters Worlds was the shit. Yeah. Because I was only coaching, and it's Vegas right outside. Yeah. Good time. Yeah. Always a good time. Good time to be had, for sure. Yes. Many a good time. Got robbed. No like, way. Like low-key robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Pickpocketed? Swindled? No. More, yeah, Finessed? more like more like swindled. Finessed? More like yeah. Finessed a little bit. Got got fed a bunch of drinks by ladies that promised to remove articles of clothing. Mm. And I was enticed by that. That's how they get that you. Possibility. And so they says, Well, give me a bunch of money. And I says, Well, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and then I had some more drinks, and they says, Here, how about some more drinks? And so I had some more drinks because they promised to take off a bunch more clothing. And I says, Well, that's a great idea, too. But then I had too many drinks. And I'm like, Well, it's time to go home now. And they says, No, you should give us a bunch more money. I'm like, well, I'm in the habit now. Here you go. It's crazy. I have a bunch more money. Right? So parts, I know. Parts of that speech reeked of letter, Kenny. I just want you to know. I'm sure. I'm, I'm influenced. I'm I, saw the, I saw the big guy. I forget his name. And then I said, <laughs> I, was like, oh. I, get a little, I get a little squirrely on you. Mm-hmm. I was like, Letterkenny. That, is, that sounds straight out of Letterkenny. Probably. And then he says, yeah. Yeah. 
at the end of that one, I hand them a big stack of money and then walked out the front door and didn't get, didn't get anything for that money. So then spent like two more months on the phone back and forth checking videotapes to get back the money for which I did not receive any services. How did it work out? Just oh, I got the money know. eventually. Oh, did you? Okay, cool. Yeah, it was just a giant pain in the ass, but I got it. Bam. I got unswindled. <laughs> it's not a word you hear all the time. It's unswindled. But you know, any sort of I guess, gray market or black market, the services come first and then the money. Money isn't given first with hopes of services second. This is well, sure. like rule number one. Sure. <laughs> Convince thought of that. You weren't so drunk. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to... That's why they feed you a bunch there. of booze in the casinos, because you stop thinking about back. that. Yeah. Circle back to it. Oh, yeah. As needed. Yeah, that's a good one. I got to get a sticky note or something. <laughs> right Services <down>. rendered. <laughs> Cash. Yeah. <sighs> Happens to the best of us. Yeah. When's Masters Worlds again? Let's get after this. Let's go. Summer? Is it in the summer? Uh, I think they keep pushing it back. It's like September-ish now. <laughs> Early fall. Oh, yeah. It was around it was around my birthday. But then, like, it was mid-August, and now they're pushing it back, and then COVID has jacked up the tournament schedule. Something That's good. Years. Push it back a little further. They're doing pans in Texas. They're doing nogi pans like this weekend. Oh, in they're Texas. doing all kinds of shit in Texas because the yep. restrictions are less and yeah. they can get away. It's they're having a full on UFC. I'm pretty sure that the IBJJF might just be moving all the majors to Texas. Huh. That should be crazy. Because the Dallas Open was in my hometown. Like it was just right down the road. Most most tournaments would be in like Dallas or Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Dallas Open was always in my hometown. The nogi pans, May 15th and 16th. Where at? Uh, north. North Richland Hills. Hills. Yeah, Night Tech Sports Center, right? Uh, you get that far. Oh, it doesn't say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, NRH, that's the Night Tech Sports Center. So how is that not just the IBJJF saying, well, fuck everybody, we want money? <laughs> that's exactly what their business model is. <laughs> like, well, what? Do y'all have your black belt cards? Yeah. Y'all y'all registered with the Federation? <laughs> no, not me. Yeah. Hell no. $400 for No, a black no, belt. not that one. The USBJJF. $35. Oh. Okay. No, no, no. That's... Get registered with the USBJJF. Your card carries over both sides. And Does it? 35 bucks a year. Good tip. <laughs> Did not know that. Don't get fucking... Pro tip? Here's how you get unswindled. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on the ship club every other day. <clears throat> yep, yep. And that's... then when the IBJJF says, send me 400 bucks, you say, nah, mm -hmm. motherfucker. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I did was like, if you really want to know if I'm a black belt, go talk to my professor. He'll tell you. Never. Yeah, yeah. Well, four hundred dollars plus you have to show them the certificate from the referees program at a major tournament. Yeah, like and they only come through if a major tournament's coming through, and it's like the day before. It's like five hours because the rules are ridiculous. I got my brown belt directly from Carlinos. He handed it to me, and we took pictures, and then he took it back, and then I had to go to his store and buy a belt for fifty dollars. <laughs> My professor would always tell me, my professor's name was Alan Moeller, he was the first American black belt under Team Alliance, and he would always tell me how lucky I was that he was just, he charged me 1500 bucks a year as a um, affiliation uh, dues, but I could have a seminar with him to come out, and the dues I got from the seminar would count towards that, so we would make that money in a seminar, pay him off, and then he would never charge for belting, he would never charge for geese, he didn't make us wear patches, like he was just... Really laid back, open about it, and he would never stop rubbing it in my face about how lucky I was. <laughs> <laughs> Always made sure to tell me that. Uh -huh. He's like, man, Blake, if I'm getting striped from Jacques Array, I got to fly him out first class. I got to put him up in a nice hotel. And then he comes out, teaches a seminar, and then he leaves. I'm like, wow, yeah. Because he's not under Team Alliance anymore. The same way like Roberto Jimenez and uh, his father aren't under Alliance anymore. All for kind of the same reasons. But yeah, it's always something about money. Yeah. Always comes down to money, always too much money. Yeah, you know. Yeah, the Gracie Bio affiliation was something like a thousand plus bucks a month. Uh, a month, and it, everyone has to wear. Got to buy their keys. The, their buy their official keys, the official rash guard underneath the official gi. Yeah, the official whatever. Yeah. I had a buddy who ran a school uh, like that. His name was no. Alejandro Segura, 
And he, he would invite me out to train, and he was really cool that he didn't make me wear the geese. He's like, you just come train with me. We have a good time. You don't have to wear the gi. I was like, okay, cool. I'll come train then. Because, like, everybody else, like, they had to put – like, if you were going to take a picture, you had to take your gi off, put their gi on. But he never made us do that, which is oh, always really nice. Yeah. And it's like a $200, $250 gi. It's not like – And it's not even, like, a great gi. No. It's like a gi. You know it's what I mean? Gi- For it's got a lot of patches on it. It's super colorful. <laughs> if, you like, if you like red and white and blue, it's all right. Yeah. Hmm. There are benefits to being Ronin. Yeah, I was never yeah. I was never a stickler about that. I didn't I if you trained with me I wouldn't let you wear like another academy's patch. Like if you were like straight up over here now, I would right. like it if you wore my patch, but I was never that was that was about it. Yeah. I didn't mean, talk about gee colors, you didn't have to buy my stuff, like it was Yeah. We have geese, you're welcome to buy them. You're welcome to buy He's online. Mm-hmm. There's tons of cool ones. We were pretty lucky, though, that uh, Gameness Fight Sports, are you familiar with them? Mm-hmm. They were... I have a Gameness ski. Yeah, they were like I'm 30 like minutes up the road. So yeah. I had a really like intimate relationship with the owners over there, and they, nice. they made our geese for us, which was nice. always really cool. We put their standard gi, and they put our patches on there and like have it all packaged up real nice. It was, it was really cool. Yeah, those, those are good people. I like those Gameness people a lot. And there it is. Yeah. yeah. It's super, super insightful. Um, just from somebody that's been working in jiu since they're 15. Mm-hmm. That was uh, one of the guys who, because um, when we first started, we were going to, my, my original professor, Terry Corcoran, he was under Carlos Machado, and we were going to be a Machado school originally. And when we took the little seminar that they did to become an affiliate, that was what the guy told me. He was like, we've never had somebody who started in jiu-jitsu. Like most people come from taekwondo or wrestling or something like that. But like my first ever experience into martial arts was jiu-jitsu. I didn't know anything else besides that. And he thought he was really taken aback by that too. So yeah, I've, I've got nothing but an experience from that standpoint. My high school didn't have a wrestling team. You know, I wasn't... I wasn't athletic. I was always kind of a nerd, <laughs> you know. And that's jujitsu. Was it was um, because I've been I've been doing sleight of hand like magic and things like that since I was you know ten years old, and it was the closest thing that I had ever found to that. Like the way that I think when I roll is the same huh. way I think when I'm performing. Nerds do really well in jujitsu. Yeah, it's just it's the just, intelligence is a is a huge benefit. I wouldn't even say intelligence. It's just the same kind of thing, you know. I'm I'm presenting something to you but really i've got another intention behind that you oh, know, yeah. i'm showing you this but i really want that you know i'm yeah. grabbing your arm but i really want your neck i yeah. want you thinking about this over here so when i switch my grip it's gonna this direction yeah, slide exactly. of hand yeah. is is a part of trapping is a big part of jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. for sure yeah well and i think misdirection works off of like a a pretty big psychological principle, right? And that's what translates, Mm -hmm. is the idea that like, I'm doing this to get to this, Mm -hmm. but all you, your mind is in the present, right? Your mind is in the present, my mind is on the future, Mm -hmm. and so I have the advantage. And I think that's why nerds do well, right? Because nerds are always thinking about their little, their next little fantasy thing, Mm -hmm. or the the mind on the future, mind on the, There was a TED Talk I listened to from a guy named Apollo Robbins, who is uh, he's a magician, but he's really known for being a pickpocket. And he always described misdirection as there's a dude in your brain who is constantly analyzing everything. But when I ask you a question or I present something different, you have to look that up. So the guy turns around and he starts looking through the files. And while he's turned around, that's when I'm attacking. You know, I'll present this to you, it's going to make you think I need to break that grip and breaking that grip. It sets up my other hand to move, you know, that kind of thing. Don't think of the number 10. Yeah, exactly. First thing you're going to think of number 10. To not think of it, you have to think first think of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was always, that was, that was just the thing that really stuck with me. And, um, yeah, yeah. I was a professional magician for about a year and a half. You're a professional. Oh yeah. Oh snap. Yeah. Nice. We used to, we used to, it was a buddy of mine. I was actually at a party. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing magic since I was a kid, you know, so I was, did you have a stage name? 
Uh, yeah, Vegas was my stage name. Uh-huh. It was uh, somebody wrote up about somebody wrote up about one of our shows too because it was it was a nickname I had in high school because I would do magic for people and um, I was from Las Vegas like that was where I lived for a little while. My dad was in the military and um, that was a nickname that stuck. I mean, people to this day call me that. Like that's just how people a lot of people know me. Oh yeah, and. Um, uh, started to go from there. I, I was at this party and I was just doing magic for people. And I guess there was another dude in my hometown who was like big in the hip hop scene and like just the, the, the local scene about like getting booked for things. And he found me at a party and we start talking shop. I start hanging out with him. We book a show at one of the bars in town, sell out. Like, I mean, $25 a ticket. I mean, we packed the place to capacity, sold the whole thing out. And then from there, we just toured all over texas like san marcos san antonio uh houston dallas my hometown i mean we went all over the place just doing shows for people <laughs> that was fun he did magic with you or he did a hip-hop he does he section? did he, he was a hip-hop artist in locally in town so we had like he was had relationships with the promoters but he'd always been a magician too <laughs> and he never really took off with that so uh-huh. once we kind of teamed up and built this show together we would take that premise and we'd go and sell it to different venues and we just go perform all over the state and it was probably the coolest time of my life that was so much fun nice. yeah we had a really good time did you cut him in half or did he cut you in half uh you know it was really wasn't big illusions our our thing was we tried to take the most simple objects and do magic with that so our magic store was the dollar tree we'd go into the dollar tree and we'd say we need to find five things and do magic with it. We just give ourselves challenges. Yeah. One of the challenges was you have to go into the dollar store and build a trick on the shelf to where it's whatever's on the shelf, we rearrange it to make a magic trick. So we had found these different like cleaners, like uh, oven cleaner, counter cleaner. They were all in the same cans, but they had different colored lids. Uh-huh. So we rearranged them in a certain way that we could predict <laughs> whichever can you would pick, uh-huh. just based off of like counting and like uh-huh. you know little misdirections and Turn things the like that. To the side a little yeah, bit. so we would have people come up down the aisle and we'd stop them and say, "Hey, do you want to come help us with this?" And we'd do it from there. So we would always have this giant like poster board that had the magic show written real shitty on it just because we wanted it to look as natural as possible without you know understanding that there was a trick to it where if you go to a stage magic show like it's this giant cage with a tiger in it you're like there's something up with that there's something to that you don't just have one of those around the house where we had stuff that you would find around the house that they're like how the hell would you do that there was one show we did it was a it was a valentine's day show that we did in a black box in Louisville, uh, Louisville, Texas. And it was um, a game show theme for Valentine's Day. And we had, uh, we picked a couple out of the audience and they sat at this table. And it was almost like a dating show game where they would play these different games to win prizes. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we always won. But um, we would make them go through all these different things like, oh man, I, I don't remember most of it. I remember the last trick because the last trick was my favorite. We had had this little globe that we had found at the dollar store and we gave it to them and we gave them a marker and we said put the globe behind your back and make a big x with the marker somewhere on the globe so they would do that we'd put that off to the side and at the top of the show we had a box where everybody would write a country on a piece of paper and slip it into the box so they did that the box was sitting on the table they made the mark with the x on the globe we had the partner who didn't make the x pick out of the box one of the countries and there was this giant framed picture covered on the back of the stage. So we find the globe, and it turned out they'd made this big X over Brazil. Mm-hmm. The guy picked out a slip of paper that somebody had written Brazil on, like somebody from the audience wrote uh-huh. Brazil on. And in the back, the picture that was covered the whole time was just this giant poster of Brazil that we'd had set up. Nice. And it was this big crescendo. And since they won that one, one of the sponsors was a steakhouse, and they won a $200 steak dinner nice. for Valentine's Day the next night. So just stuff like that, just basic little items that we could find to make the magic more impactful, you mm-hmm. know, because if it's like a prop that looks like a magic prop, it's cool, but it doesn't have that same impact that it would if it was like a piece of poster board that you drew a tiger on and it jumped out. Of, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So like that. Mm-hmm. And we had, yeah, we had so much fun doing that. Just, yeah, it was a good time. And that was all while managing the gym? Yeah. Yeah. That was all at the same time. So I would, uh, I'd get off work, I'd go to his house, we'd write a little bit. He was more of the idea guy who would come up with the ideas for the tricks. 
I'd help refine them, and I wrote like the scripts and like the jokes and all that kind of stuff. So we had like this cool team mentality that we had. Nice. And over time, we would find like other like people who were interested in magic, and we had like this magic club that we would have at one of the bars upstairs, and it was a really good time. It was a really good time, and then COVID. Well, I moved here first, but COVID would have shut that down. But yeah, it was a uh, it was a good time. Probably probably one of the coolest things I ever got to do. It wasn't very lucrative, but it was fun. Dude, something to something to check out when the uh, restrictions lift. Yeah, I'm gonna find some places that are gonna book shows because I'm I really want to get back to that. I really miss that a lot. There's this little bar on Main Street in Longmont called the Speakeasy. Mm -hmm. I'm try to get in over there, see if they because nice. that seems like the kind of vibe I would think that they would like a magician for something like that. Yeah. Where's the Speakeasy? I know that name. It's right off Main Street. It's right on the it's on the Main Street corner of Main and something else. I don't remember the the road. Main and something. Yeah. Anyways, doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, you'll find it. It's like across the street from Hefe's, I think. Uh, Google knows. Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu magic, right? Yeah, they are. They they go hand in hand really well. It was uh, probably the biggest reason why I stuck around with it is it just kind of activates the same parts of my brain. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That's always the best. Tricked when you. you. When you straight up fool somebody is always the best. So I had, much fun. Yeah. My, uh, <clears throat> the first show we did, my finale was, um, I had, uh, I had all these different packs of gum in a bag and the gag was like, I, I come out and I say something like, uh, who knows my, my, my biggest passion in life. And somebody in the crowd yells jujitsu and I go, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. And I just pull this big bag of gum and I'm like, it's gum. I went to a gum convention. I found all these different packs of gum and I had somebody reach in, pick one out and they held it up. And then, uh, the next part of the trick, I have somebody pick a card or the same guy picks a card. I spread them out. I snap and their card vanishes and it showed up like folded up in the sealed pack of gum that he had. Like saw the cellophane on it and everything. And that kind of, that was a big reveal. That was a fun one. Nice. Yeah, that's a good time. It's way cooler than it sounds, I promise. <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm already trying to figure out how that works. Yeah, I mean, the gum pack had the cellophane on it and everything, and the, yeah. the card was folded up inside of the gum. So I had to peel the cellophane off, open it. It was like a pack of five gum or something. You had to like slide it open and like in front of all the gum was like a card folded up into four pieces, and it was the one that he picked. It was freaking awesome. Yeah, now I've seen the tutorial on how to stick a card in an orange, but <laughs> how to put it into some sealed cellophane. And I yeah. watched the grape, the video on how to grapefruit your boyfriend. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Grapefruiting. I know that one. A service to humanity if ever there was one. Right? Kind of, kind of the same thing. Cool. I got something to Google now. <laughs> oh boy, do you. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Oh God! <laughs> what have I done? Something you're gonna thank us for forever. Okay. <laughs> forever. Yeah, you showed that to me. I show that to everybody that asks. It's <laughs> truly a public service. It really is. Yeah. Gift to humanity. Treasure. Yeah. So, uh, what next? What do you want to talk about, guys? I don't know. Jamie, where are we at? Well, we're just about at an hour. So, so you guys got any more questions for me? Yeah. Shit, now I just want to roll. Yes. Right. <laughs> Wish I brought my gear. I'll be there on Monday. I'm hoping to start going to the Saturday and Sunday classes too. I'm just usually out here on the weekends. Where do you where do you hang out? Um, it's called. Uh, my girlfriend lives at a Griffiths Center. Like it's an apartment complex over there. So I'm usually over at her place on the weekends. In Broomfield, Westminster. Yeah, Broomfield, Westminster area. Yeah. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, but I'm. Uh, I live out in Longmont. I live off of 16th Street in Longmont. I'm like eight minutes away from Dark Horse. Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty lucky. I, uh, I went the first time I'd come out like maybe a year ago, like right when I first moved here because, uh, old buddy of mine, Michael knew, um, 
I'm terrible with names. Cam, he knew Cameron. Uh -huh. I used to work together, and I got to come out and roll with you guys. Uh, then, and then as soon as I moved to Longmont, I was like, "That is that the same place that Dark Horse was?" And luckily, it was like right down the road, so oh. came to check it out. Yeah, Cam was the one that was obsessed with uh, the Meow Brothers. Really? Yeah. If we're talking about the same Cameron. Uh, tall dude. No, nope, real tall Cameron. guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so many people with the same name. Yeah. Thank goodness for nicknames. Yeah. You should come through and see us on the, on the weekend. Yeah, I need to. It's you know, it's one thing after another came up. I was gonna start coming on the weekends, and I got this eye surgery. I didn't think I was gonna get in as fast as I did because I called on Wednesday and like you can come in on Friday. I was like, oh shit, okay, now I have to go. But how long is the the healing process? They said two to four weeks. I'm gonna go with two because I need to trade again. I come in and I see everybody rolling through and. Pohada, and then I come in for class. I'm like, man, I want to do that. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because drilling is all right, but you know, I'm, I'm I want to roll. Yeah, yeah. It used to be a month to six weeks. If I didn't roll, like I'd get clinically depressed. Yeah, every, dude. Every yeah, time. yeah. Can't like, sleep. When, when this first out. COVID first happened, dude, I was losing my mind. I was yeah. in a good gym routine, like, and then I was training too. Like, I was ready to start like competing again because I was focusing on myself instead of yeah. my academy. And that all got shut down. So now I got to get re motivated again. <laughs> yeah, just getting into, into training will do that. Yeah. Yeah. Just getting your ass beat. Like when I first came back and I was out of breath and not used to the altitude, that's what really motivated me. I'm like, I'm sick of this. Uh huh. God damn it. <laughs> Can't breathe. This is one of my white belt. <gasps> I remember, like, I first started training again and I remember talking to uh, somebody at the compound and I was like, this is why people quit. <laughs> I'm like, I can't breathe. My head hurts. I can't see straight. Uh -huh. This is why people stop. At least uh -huh. I have the foresight to understand that it gets better. Some uh -huh. people just don't understand that it gets uh -huh. better. It's just like this? Well, not really. Yeah. Kind of. There's always more challenges. How long does it take the average person to get their black belt? The average person doesn't get their black belt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It took me just under 10 years. Like Just under. Like nine years... 11 months in like two weeks, <laughs> just under 10 years. Nice. And I was training every day. Like it was my job. And right. It still took me that long. Right. Yeah. If it wouldn't have been my job, I don't think it would have panned out as well as it did. No, and I think we kind of, we touched on that in, a, in an earlier episode when we were talking about, um, I think it might have been the Blue Belt Blues episode. But kind of talking about the, Black belts are kind of exceptional. Yeah. In that, like, you didn't put in a regular amount of effort. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, if you're putting in a regular amount of effort, it's a really long time and you get discouraged and, you know, things happen. Uh, right? It's, it's an exceptional amount of effort. It's an exceptional push to get to the black belt. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're if you're for real, you yeah. Know, some people buy it or whatever, but if you're for real, like yeah, yeah. it takes hard, hard, hard work. It seems yeah. like if you talk to any black belt long enough, you'll find that there was like a they they definitely hit, hit at least one really really rough patch at mm -hmm. some point in the process. Dark night of the soul type thing. It was lucky like, for me that am it was... I really gonna keep going? Am I am I gonna quit? Like an, an injury, some life changes, you know, like a bunch of things just like stack up. They're like. Ugh. Yeah, I remember the moment it was for me. I was at my first academy, and uh, I had just gotten my blue belt. And there was some older kid who had come in. He was a lot bigger than me, and he just bullied the shit out of me and was just talking shit. He's like, "You shouldn't even have your blue belt. Like, you can't even handle me. Like, fuck you. This doesn't make any sense." And then some other one of the guys came in and just beat his ass and came up to me and told me, "He's like, just keep moving forward. Like, you are where you are. Just keep going." And that was that was the eye opening moment for me, where I was like, "I can't quit now." Nice. Like, you know, I've, I I just got embarrassed and it was like, I, am I for real? Like, I, I needed to see it all yeah. the way through no matter what. Yeah. And it was, it was that moment specific. I'll never forget. I'll never forget that moment for the rest of my life. But I was just, I was bullied into it. I was like, yeah. I'm not weak. I don't suck. I just don't get it yet. Give yeah. me some more time and I'll figure it out. And that I'm was the moment better for me. every day. Yeah, that was the moment for me. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a blog at one point because I, I had a, like a, meltdown right like a at, at every belt level really 
several mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I'm like, this is like, this is like a crisis of faith, right? Yeah. It's like, I, I believe in this. I want this. This is, this is everything, but it's not working. Yeah. Right. And so I was like, oh, it's, it's a crisis of game. And so for a while I had a blog called crisis of game, uh, talking about specifically things like that. Like mm -hmm. my, my game just fell apart and my faith in myself fell apart and my, you know, like, and then how do I, how do I get back? Yeah. I how do I keep going? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I just found like, okay, every single crisis of game didn't have a solution. Did you ever have like, but just like grind through it? Yeah. It was for me when I would go to tournaments and I wouldn't perform well. Like I used to have this giant dent in the side of my car cause I lost a match and I went outside and just punched the shit out of my car because I knew I knew what I was doing, but I could never show it. And that was the big part for me. Like I was so worried about what other people thought yeah. of my jujitsu yeah. that I started to lose faith in myself and I would, you know, I'd lose at a tournament, I'd take time off, I'd get real depressed and it was finally separating, you know, what I actually know versus, you know, what I have issues with in tournaments. Like that was a big thing for me. Like I quit competing for a while because it was just so hard on my mental health that I, I started to believe that I was that one match when obviously you're not, you mm, know, right. just a but, moment in time. Yeah. The pressure does weird things to people. Yeah. It's most people don't compete well. Yeah. You know? I definitely don't. Like I definitely perform better in the gym than I do on a tournament mat. Like you'll huh. see me in a tournament. Like what the, f what the hell was that? Like, you know what you're doing? I'm like, eh, well, that happens. Yeah. I think, uh, I had a lot of that like self-doubt kept me off of competition mats mm -hmm. when i would go compete i would do really well but you know it was four weeks out or six weeks out or you know some some time before the tournament i'd be training and going along and like wait that blue belt just tore my game to pieces mm -hmm. like I'm not ready. I can't. I can't compete. No, like can't compete now. Yeah. Right. There's no, yeah. I'm just I lost a role. That's yeah. a thing too. Or a section of a role. You know. Yeah. How much of jujitsu is your identity? Like jujitsu was my whole identity. It was who I was. So when I didn't hit what I expected of myself, I looked down on myself, and it started to bleed into other parts of my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because that was my whole identity. Like if I can't do this, what am I? Who am I? You know. When you're kind of talking to a table full of people whose a large portion of their identity is jujitsu, yeah, right. Yeah. Like that's that's. They asked me in the interview, "What's the yeah. what's the greatest achievement you've ever had?" And I was like, "Getting my black belt for sure. Like that was the greatest thing I've ever done. I don't know what else I'm going to do in my life that'll equate to that because I've by the time I'm 31, I will have been doing jujitsu longer than I haven't been. Yeah, you know, like. Yeah. Whoa. I know more about jujitsu for sure at this point than anything else on earth. Oh yeah. Like whatever. yeah. It's my whole thing. Right. And honestly, I, a lot of times I think about it as like the only thing I've done. Yeah. Right. Like oh, I graduated school. Mm, everybody does that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a common thing. I, you know, bought a car. I achieved some level of adulting or whatever bullshit. Like, okay, everybody does that. Did I actually accomplish anything or did I just, you know, like, live a functional life like everybody else yeah, exactly where like i i'm a black belt i did that i did that thing yeah like less right. than one percent of people who start do that right you know like, okay that's i mean shit that's kind of the only thing i've ever actually done I mean, the only place i ever moved the wheel uh yeah i think that's uh that's a like i said a kind of different level of of commitment to the game right like mm -hmm. you're saying the average average i don't know about average people because i think average people definitely get their black belts um it's an average effort yeah absolutely never i think that's a more eloquent way to say it yeah right like average effort is not going to get it and i think the only thing that i ever put in more than average effort was this was this yeah i've also noticed that like people who have gotten their black belt they usually have also like accomplish something else or maybe not accomplish, but have had something else in their life that they understand the effort it takes to get something. You know, I feel like people who drop out in early white belt or blue belt don't have that thing that has driven them before. They don't know? understand what it takes to reach mastery yeah, at, a given, at a, yeah. any given thing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for me, it was, again, it was magic. Like I had 
like all this time just beating myself up like it has to be right it ha like with magic it has to be right if it's not a hundred percent right if the technique is not clean they're going to see through it yeah. and it's not going to be right the same right. way that if you know you want to hit a sweep your technique has to be clean yeah. it's not going to work or at least against a higher level person you know yeah. against somebody at your own speed if you don't do it correctly it won't work yeah. either that or you're crazy <laughs> you're either crazy or you've done something else well, and then there's the ever the, the additional layer with jujitsu where like, if you don't do it right, there it's not going to work, and potentially, you get hurt. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm I'm sure there's there's magic. Yeah, you that, don't do it right. You get laughed off stage. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. Ho like hopefully, right. Yeah. Hopefully, like not messing with tigers or something where you could get hurt. Yeah. By and large, you know, it's a little. It's got that immediate mentality where, get it right. You got to do it over mm -hmm. and over and over again. Get it right. Yeah, if you don't like, if you don't enjoy the hard part, then it's you're not gonna you're not gonna get far. You know, if you don't enjoy the you know getting crushed a little bit, you know, when you're on bottom side control to really understand how to escape, you're not gonna you're not gonna go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and really enjoy enjoy the the really hard parts because mm -hmm. the easy and glorious parts are like two seconds yeah in all of your lifetime of training mm -hmm. you stand up on the podium you're like yes and then you get down and you're like what now <laughs> <laughs> you training on monday <laughs> yeah <Shit>. right <laughs> my track the next morning you're like i am so sore yeah. i can't move mm. yeah well but then you go right back to the academy where the same guy that was kicking your ass on thursday is back on monday and doesn't give a crap what medal you have exactly. he's gonna kick your ass again so, the, back mikey mushmeshi competed and uh, who's number one? Friday. Yeah, hey, triangle homeboy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah he caught him in a triangle. Mounted, mounted triangle. I don't remember how how it was, but yeah, I know he triangled him. I didn't uh, catch the event. I know, like he did the interview afterwards. He's like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna go blah 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 and go train after this." I was like, "After that?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <That> was, <laughs> All think... during lockdown, he and his sister had just been training. And Tammy is Tammy. awesome. Yeah. Tammy Musumeshi is awesome. one of my She's favorite awesome. matches of all time. Was her match in the finals, I think it was her versus Michelle Nicolini, where she got like arm the, barred across her back and just snapped her arm and kept going because she yeah. was winning. Yeah. I mean, she lost the match, but that was like the coolest thing. She I'd did ever not seen. tap. No, yeah. she didn't tap, that and was, she kept fighting with that. That was one of the arm. nastiest breaks I've seen. In like Jiu across her back, like yeah. what the fuck? Yeah. I would have tapped, like, but she was ahead by two points in the finals of the worlds. Like, yeah. are you gonna let it snap? I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to think I would, but honestly, I don't think so. Definitely. When I was younger, I think I would have. Yeah, I've been like, fuck it. But now I'm like, chokes mm, are different. I like, got, if you put me in a choke, I'll, I'll, you know, if it's like, I, my, to do. I had a buddy who was really big about the baseball bat choke, loved it, and he he put me, he tapped me in my guard one time with it. Like, I had my clothes guard, and he had that grip, and he actually made me tap with it. In that moment, I was like, I'll go out next time. No way. In my guard? <laughs> nah, 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 dude. It's one of the times I went out. Actually, it was baseball bat choke. Mm -hmm. Professor Sergio caught me, and I passed his guard. Yeah, and you're like, I'm in it, dude. I'm going to go. Right? <laughs> yeah, he right just to sleep. yeah, and I dropped, and my elbows and knees pinched together over the top of him. So it took it took two people to peel me off. Cause really? Because you tensed up real bad? Yeah. 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 I, I pinched down. like I went into, into side control mode. I win. And then, like pinched and then went dead weight. <laughs> <laughs> I had something similar happen to me. Where somebody put me in a baseball bat choke and I went out, but I didn't realize I was out. Like I, I felt like I was still kind of conscious because I remember he put me out and he put the choke on and I grabbed a leg and I remember I'm trying to take him down, but for some reason my head kept doing this. And I'm like, why can't I stop my head from moving? And then I noticed somebody's patting me on the back, like, let go. And it was my professor. Like, I completely stopped fighting homeboy. And I went over to the closest person because I guess I was out. And my professor went to wake me up. And I immediately slapped a single on him. And he's like, get <laughs> off. <laughs> it's like, good instincts, but no, dude. Yep. Yeah. Like yeah. Vanderlei Silva back in the day when he'd get rocked and he'd like fall down and grab their leg, climb up and then start punching again. I was always like, whoa. Yeah, dude. Right. That's some determination. Or like the Noguera <laughs> brothers where they just get straight knocked out and rocked on their back and somebody come in to punch them and they triangle them. Mm. What? <laughs> How does that guy keep winning? It's a, it's a single-mindedness right there. Yeah. You tire him out by letting him punch you in the face. It's uh -huh. a solid strategy. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get tired soon. <laughs> it worked for a long time. 
Yeesh. Man, that was awesome too. Like old school shoot box. Vanderlei and um, O'Gara brothers. Dude, Pride was the was MMA, dude. Yeah. Oh, Golden amazing. Age. Just Fedor Milianenko, Mirko Krokop. Krokop was amazing. Yeah, Holy dude. shit. Right leg hospital, left leg cemetery, dude. <laughs> <laughs> They'd always have some sort of freak show fight. All right. I loved it. The middleweight Grand Prix where Shogun Hua went all the way to the top. 24 years old. Yeah. Young Next. Rampage just like body slamming people through the earth. Oh, dude, amazing. the one time it was in the, I think it was the second fight between him and Vanderlei where Vanderlei knocks Rampage out and he moves forward and just starts dangling in the middle of the ropes. Mm -hmm. oh, knocks man. his head through the ropes. He's like hanging off of dude, it. Yeah. yeah. That's the one where uh, Vanderlei's feeding him knees and catches him out on his feet. Yeah. And yeah. he just falls in between the ropes. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I have you. I have that ESPN app. I think I'm gonna go home and watch some old school pride fights tonight. Me too. The best. Uh, it's a trip too, because like those fights change so much of how we train for MMA now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, like it was so segmented before that, and then yeah, I mean guys like Vanderlei and Vitor Belfort, and like that pride changed. Changed the way we train it. It was a trip. Yeah. That in the cage versus the ring, there are a lot of nuances to that too that people don't yeah. think about. You know, I think that was a reason that a lot of Japanese fighters had such a hard time moving over to the UFC is because of how you had to fight in the cage versus the ring. You know, there's a lot more breaking off of the ropes, you know, because you didn't want to fall through and they would stop the fight. Whereas up against the cage, they would just beat your ass up against the cage. Yeah. Just, yeah just little things like that. They had a 10 minute first round. In a five minute second round, you got yeah. the yellow cards, dude. That's why yeah. the fights were so exciting. Yeah. Because you get the yellow card, that's like what, five, ten percent of your purse taken away right there? Like yeah. on the spot? Oh, shit. Sometimes yeah. the match would that's end. That's what that was. And the judges were like, eh, fuck it, fight some more. <laughs> yeah. Keep fighting, huh? Yeah. Well, that was minute, a good ten fight. Ten minute first round, two rounds, ten minute one round, five minutes the second round is the way to do it. Yeah. I think that I think that's gonna lead to more exciting fights. I think it's gonna lead to more finishes. And I think it's just I think it's just better to watch i think it's a more exciting exciting way to watch fighting well and i think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is the more you restrict it the more complicated you make the rule set mm -hmm. the more people play the rule set and win the game instead of fighting yeah right take yeah. away take away the rule make it as simple as possible right like big 10 minute round one five minute round if you need it but yeah like make it more simple so that they just fight i think that also win a fight not win a game yeah it also goes into like the ibjjf so much of their rules are ambiguous there's so much there's so much room for interpretation to the referee which leads to a lot of screwing which leads to a lot of like bad advantages like advantages i think are the worst thing for the sport honestly like a near takedown a near sweep that is open so much to interpretation uh, especially when like there are no unbiased refs uh, there's always going to be a ref who is on a certain team who is always going to lean towards their their teammate. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are a finite number of black belts and there are a finite number of referees and a finite number of teams. Plus, there's a little corruption everywhere. So there's always well, going to be human some. Human beings kind of are like, human beings. Yeah. The, it, honestly, it has gotten well, a lot better over the years. Corruption in Brazil? I think, <laughs> I think not. is not a thing. The. It's gotten a lot better over the years. Yeah. Uh, it used to be so blatant, so bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the guy who gets it the worst or got it the worst was Keenan. There was every year I'd watch Keenan and he would just there was always that one little mistake he would make that would just always it lose him the match in spectacular fashion. So well, and back in the day, like was it all of BJ Penn's students? BJ won because he just was undeniable, but all of his students lost to Brazilians all the time. Yeah, BJ like, Penn is such an anomaly though. Yeah, but I mean, like, his students weren't bad. It was just like, no, no, no. The Americans are done now. No. Yeah. Right. You guys can't win anymore. <laughs> I, got, I got gringoed in Brazil for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I got mean, a takedown, which should have won me the match. No points. And I'm, like, standing there, and they, like, raise the other guy's hand. I'm like, wait, what the fuck just happened? Got to finish, man. That's why <clears> guys <throat> like uh, Mikey Musumeshi are going to be on top. Can't, can't deny it. He finishes. You know, yeah. or um, that Jamil Coleman out of Team Lloyd Irvin. That kid was sick too. Like the second, like the third American to do it. <sighs> Poor kid. 
Yeah. I hear t- Team Lloyd Irvin, and I'm gonna be like, oh, poor kid. Yeah, but but he's produced some of the best guys. Ryan Hall, who's my favorite, came from TLI. Uh, yeah. Keenan, JT Torres. Yeah. Like, I'm not I'm, big about the culture over there because produces, the guy's kind of a douchebag and he, did a lot of he's messed a up things. Fucking cult leader, man. Yeah. He's kind of a douchebag. Is an understatement. Yeah. Yeah. He's slimy. Disgust, yeah. yeah, right. So there's I mean, been a lot of bad things out of that academy, but I mean, you make a guy like Ryan Hall, or Jamil Coleman, or Keenan, or JT, like doing something right. I well, guess. sure, but I mean, like the the ends don't justify the means. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm right? not like, like praising Lloyd Irvin by any means. Let's uh, let's you, some, you love him and you want to have his babies. Quit <laughs> lying, man. If you can make me like Ryan Hall, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Because that is the, that's my hero, dude. I love that guy. Yeah. Amazing game. His so heel good. hook on BJ Penn was spectacular. He makes people look stupid. Yeah. He makes people look stupid. I mean, how many people pull guard in MMA? <clears throat> right? Uh-uh. <laughs> no one. You, you can't, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, especially in pride when you just get <laughs> stomped in the face. <laughs> Soccer kicked. <laughs> or Vanderlei's guard passes, you'd split your feet open and stomp on your face. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, that's gangster. Oh. Or when you turtle out and they can just knee you in the top of the head and I can't you even cry. imagine, dude. Like, I would have a hard time doing that to somebody in a street fight. It's like a car crash over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> that. Getting kicked in the head on all fours. I can't even, like, your neck's not very strong against somebody's hip and leg that's just gonna, wah, right? I mean, yeah. Coup, like, coup, coup, bang, 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 bang. The bang, Sakuraba bang. fight where he just, like, knees him in the top of the head. Eight, ten, twelve times, just. And those guys keep going after that too. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, nah. go, I gotta go back and watch Pride again. <laughs> Pride right. is so fun. Cool, it's so good. I'm in. I'm in. All right, viewers out there uh, in TV land, let us know what your top three favorite Pride fights are. We're going to do a watch party and review those top three fights. Yeah, do that. Hopefully, we can get Blake out again yeah, live let's here do it. on on uh, Instagram and YouTube live coming up later. Ooh, I got I got one. I want to do um, I want to. Jamie, do, you're gonna make that happen, right? I want to cool. do Henzo Gracie versus um, Sakuraba. Oh yes. Yeah, it's uh, like an hour and a half. <laughs> no, what's that? Is it um? Was that Hoist? Hoist was the long one, right? I think Henzo Henzo had a pretty long one. That's the one where Sakuraba kimura his arm off. Uh huh. Yeah. And he Popped talks it about out, yeah. And Henzo's face is completely blank. Yeah, because that's but that had to hurt. Have so you seen bad. the interview after that match with Henzo? He was like, they're like, why didn't you tap? He goes. Tap. He's like, I'm. My name's Henzo Gracie. I'm. I don't tap. He's like, that was my punishment. Like, that's what I get for getting caught. It's oh like, God. whoa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have you seen the video that time where he was? Uh, he live streamed some guys trying to jump him, uh-huh. and he's chasing him, and he's just. Uh, he's yep. like, I'm gonna remember him because I gave him raccoon eyes, and he's like, what's raccoon eyes? When he picked two black eyes on some guy, he's like, I'm gonna find him. I know the right. raccoon. I'll find him. Right. <laughs> live he's just live streaming him as he's like chasing these people down and beating their ass. He's just like, this is what you do here. Right. Well, I, it even started before that. The whole, I think somebody's following me. I think, <laughs> I, I think I'm about to get mugged right now. This is, they don't know who, who I am. Can you okay. imagine being hyped about that? You're like, oh shit, I get to try my jujitsu out for real? Have you guys been in a street fight in, ever since you've been like trained? Like, well trained? I have not. I have not gotten to use it in the real world. I was a bouncer, blew through purple belt for that reason, and you know whatever for other reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got in a couple couple fights outside of that. Was it really like jujitsu based that allowed you to win, or was it just being able to overpower somebody? I yeah, I choked a guy unconscious and. put a sticker on his face for my academy. I left him out on the, the <laughs> front sidewalk. Cool. And when you choke someone out, it's always a lot of fun because they wake up and they don't remember what happened. So they'd be like, oh, that guy knocked you out. He's down there. That's him right there. And they'd like start to walk off. And they'd like get halfway down the block and they'd start looking back at you and start remembering. But then they're half a block away. So they just fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that guy right there, man. He knocked you out. Go get him. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Uh. And then, uh. <laughs> huh? nah, and I'm like, yeah, 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 go get him. They're That's like, crazy. I've never, I've never had to use it in the world, which I guess is a good thing because like you're gonna get hit or get hurt at least yeah. a little bit. So they don't have mats out there. If yeah, you, if you're wondering, out on the street, <laughs> there's, no, there's no mats. You never so think you definitely want to be on top. Yeah. Uh, 
Some Maybe. things are definitely different. They're going to try to hit you. Yeah. You'll probably take some shots. You'll probably have some bumps and bruises. I did that with like some friends. Like I had other friends who trained different martial arts and I would always talk shit. And I'm like, yeah, you don't know nothing. It's like, I'll kick your ass without throwing one punch. Right. And then I'd proceed to get my head punched into the ground. Yeah. You know, I choke him eventually, but yeah. I got punched a lot. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't a slouch. He knew what he was doing, but jujitsu still reigned supreme. 